hit record. Perfect. All right, we'll go ahead and kick this thing off. What's up, everybody? Welcome back. I'd like to welcome Mr. Kevin Thewitt to the show. Kevin has spent years in the data analytics world and research world uh, and currently works as a managing partner and analytics engineer for JetRock Analytics. Kevin, welcome to the show. I feel like we've been trying to get this episode done now for like the last week. We finally made it happen. Uh, appreciate you coming on the show, man. How's things in your world? Good, good. Yeah, I missed you when I was in Houston, but now uh, back in Austin and ha and happy to be talking with my my more like Zoom worthy background here. <laughs> there you go. No, I like it, man. I, I I don't know about you, but I always find it like such an interesting topic of conversation when you get on some like Zoom. During like when people first started doing Zooms and Teams and everything, like the backgrounds were very much chaotic. It was like your right. it was like your kids bedroom or some random place in the attic like you just never knew what you were going to see in someone's thing and now it's become this uh like this aesthetics type of thing where people have nice backgrounds and like yeah. like you you could tell you like let you set it up for like at least a nice background um was that the case or were you always kind of like dialed in with the zoom thing so i've been working uh so jet rock we've all worked from home since we started so it was in 2015 um, oh. And so I have actually like a separate office out in my backyard that I'm able to use. So I have my own kind of little work set up. Very uh, cool. And yeah, I just, my wife basically said like, you need to, you need to up your zoom background game. So <laughs> yeah. Do some, some sort of decorating behind me. I love it, man. That's like, yeah. so I have the same thing. So at home I had, we have our kids, we call it a craft room. And it was basically my kids area where they could like do slime and coloring and painting. And then when the pandemic hit, I went in there and I had like this tiny little corner that I got to set up. But then my daughter proceeded to put like all her artwork on the wall and everything. So it was like, again, it was like nothing professional by any means, but it always had a good conversation. And it wasn't until like a month ago, my wife's like, maybe you need to step it up because you seem to be still working from home every once in a while. Um, so now, now I have a professional background, but for the like, for like two and a half, three years, it was like, looked like a kindergarten classroom in the back. And so it, it feels good to have a nice background though. It's always kind of, gives you a little more credibility i feel like <laughs> so but uh i want to give a shout out to zach howard he's the one who helped set this up um did you know zach prior to jerrock or or did you meet him through jerrock uh well we so we hired zach about two years ago to, to head our business development efforts so like just reaching out to clients starting those conversations with potential clients um just in birmingham my co-founder actually uh, work with Zach as a customer like 15 years ago when so Justin was part of HPDI, which is a company that was bought by Drilling Info, which is now part of M like which is now called Inverse. Mm -hmm. um, so I think Zach managed data for for Pioneer or something like that way back when, and so they know each, knew each other from then. So there, there's a connection that kind of goes way back. But I met Zach during uh, the hiring process when we when we brought him on. Gotcha. 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 I actually, uh, I had never met him in person and I was at, did you go to Earth Tech in Denver this year? Were you there? No, no is that, no. I, I Zach on all, all, my, all the, the long distance forays. <laughs> I don't blame you. Uh, yeah, I met him there and, uh, yeah, it was, it was good to kind of catch up with him. And then he was like, man, you got to get Kevin on the show. And so here we are. Um, and yeah, so take a little pivot here. Let's talk about analytics. Obviously that's your space. Um, but I'm, I'm curious, uh, you know, the, so, what I found was in like the 2000, after the 2000 sort of 14, 16 downturn, there was a huge emphasis on like digitalization and and data analytics. And it was like this big buzz, but ultimately it, it drove a lot of CapEx into data analytics. And like, as oil and gas companies, like, we have all this data, but like, what the hell do we do with it? Um, and so I think things have evolved at a pretty good clip, but I'm curious, have you changed any core beliefs around data analytics in the energy space, like within the last couple of years, does anything come to mind? Yeah, I'm not sure I call them core beliefs, but like the the central or what I see the most demand from from clients has shifted uh, starting about three-ish years ago, where so when we started the company in 2015, uh, which was just me and my, my co-founder just doing kind of consulting work. Um, the focus was all on deal evaluation, public data. Like, so we had both come from, from Inveris um, in their analytics group. Um, that was like yeah. our background. And so initially it was working with that Inveris data or IH, IHS is the other big data provider. So it was helping companies evaluate spacing or cube development. It was all these like new techniques that were being used. And then starting about three-ish years ago, 
there's sort of to be a pretty hard shift towards doing what we call FinOps analysis. So that's companies looking at their internal data. So like their accounting data, their, for, their well forecast data, field cost data, tank volumes, all those sorts of data sets that they generate internally, um, companies started paying a lot more attention to. And all that I think is attributable to when the big, like when sort of the land rush died down of the big public companies just buying billion dollar acquisitions left and right, uh, buying land and, and the private equity backed companies, which those are most, most of our clients are the, the private equity backed, um, sm like smaller oil and gas operators. Uh, it, it became, it had, they realized they were going to have to operate these assets for several years before somebody was going to you know, write them a, a big check for them. So they started putting, paying a lot more attention to operating efficiently, mm -hmm. uh, make sure they're not spending too much money, which wells need workovers, that sort of thing. Um, right. So our business, like we just kind of follow the lead of, of the clients that we work with. They wanted a lot more of that type of analysis. So that... Today, that's about, I'd say it's about two thirds of the type of work that we do is that internal data analysis. Uh, we still also do the, the BD stuff and that's actually picked back up a little bit more too. So the, the, the industry focus has kind of shifted over time, but I'd say like high level, it went from, everyone was just trying to get a handle on what, how do, how, like, what are my competitors doing in terms of trying to produce the wells? Where should I go make new acquisitions? And then it settled down into a little bit more mature we have assets. How do we operate them efficiently? What dumb things are we doing? Because we're not looking at our data. To that, you know, what is our data telling us that we're not we're not really uh, catching on to? Was was there anything tangible or like sort of was there a theme that developed that as they were looking through a lot of the data that there was sort of some commonalities amongst operators that like this is some low hanging fruit that like really we we may have known it was there, but now the data is actually telling us that could ultimately translate into creating more value like was there anything that one could... one thing the first thing that pops to mind is like with with putting together an, an afe tracker when we do that so an, an afe that's authorization for expenditure so that's that's a case where like if an operator wants to go drill a new well or a set of wells it's their estimate for how much everything is going to cost and so a new well might cost around like eight million dollars or something like that and then they go do the work um so there end up being three different data sources that they would like to keep track of, but they're in different, they're in different places. So you have your original AFE values for, uh, we think that the uh, facility costs are gonna be this. We think the gravel that we're gonna use and the pad is gonna be this. So you have your estimates, um, then you have your field costs. Those are like the guys out in the field are saying, today I spent $80,000 on pipe. And then you have your accounting costs. So that's like what actually comes into the accounting group uh, a month or two later, uh, that they're in. So there's three different data sources that they're trying to keep in sync of how well are you doing compared to what you originally said it was going to cost. Mm. Um, and so all, all that. So one of the, one of the analyses we put together it ties that all together into an easy to digest report. And like the feedback I've heard more than once is that they don't really like if they're overrunning costs or if they're spending on something that they shouldn't. They don't find out. Um, until maybe two or three months later when the actuals come in and like right. the project is over and they're like, Oh, we actually spent $2 million more than we thought we were going to. Whereas like the, the approach that we're taking, they can see that daily, like in real time that, okay, this, this account is overrunning. Um, and so they can either go yell at their subcontractors sooner or make other adjustments. Like they understand more in real time, what, how their operations are going because Two months later, it's it's too late to do anything about it. Yeah, no, it, it kind of reminds me. I, I've been in drilling operations my entire career, and it, it was a huge sort of shift in improvement in terms of efficiency. Was understanding, you know, say directionally where your bit was at all times, like MWD. You know what I mean? And so, so like the more real time information you can receive and then make decisions based off of that. Um, ultimately you can course correct at a far rep, you know, at a far better degree than you would, like you said, waiting for a survey that you've drilled, you know, 500 feet, well, let's get a survey now. So it kind of reminds me of the same as like the more obviously real-time data you can collect, you can make real-time decisions, which ultimately drive hopefully better decisions um, and avoid costly mistakes. And the other thing to add there is it's not just more real-time decision, like the more timely decisions are better, but even that that period two months later, if you don't have an easy way of comparing, what do we originally think this was going to cost? What are the guys in the field uh, they spent? 
a lot of times like Good those kind of, the companies just aren't doing that analysis so they never even really realize that they that they overspent by that much because they're already on to the next project so i really like one of the we really try to make things like the, the idea that you need to make things as easy as possible for people to see and digest so that they'll actually use it like that's that's a big theme of what we try to do because you can build a big machine that, that does a bunch of things but if it's too if it's too cumbersome to use or it's it's too you know far away from um what people are actually trying to do in their day-to-day -day business uh, you, really, um, you have a big problem with adoption so like we really try to focus it on what like, what is what is like the most useful even if it's simple like what's the most useful thing that will help this person is it a, a report that just goes to their inbox because they don't want to learn anything they, they just want to have like a pdf report um, we do a lot of that because that can be enough like there you can build a lot more complicated things than that but getting people the information that affects their jobs uh in the easy, absolute easiest format is there's a lot of extra value from that yeah no that's uh, that's fascinating i never really thought of it from that perspective um so jetrock's slogan is is closing the gap between data and decisions which i thought was kind of interesting um how would you describe that gap currently because i think that's an interesting point to cover like when you say gap, what do you guys mean? Yeah, I think it, it, it's it's related to the, the last point that I was talking about, that companies have, um, when I think about their internal data, they ha they generate a lot of data themselves. So that, again, that's like the accounting data or how much each well is producing. But those generally sit in four or five different um, separate software applications. And there's maybe like, there's generally like one person at the company who knows how to use it and maybe export like a CSV. So you have all these little like fiefdoms that really, it's really hard to talk, like to get the analysis um, talking across data sets. And so mm -hmm. there's a lot of value locked up in these different pieces of software. So our general approach when we, work, when we work with a client is the first step is to tap into all their different data sources and get it into a cloud database. So we use Microsoft Azure as our, um, is where we store everything. And so once you do that, then you can start mixing those data sets together and producing, and whether it's like a, like I said, like a automated PDF report or interactive Spotfire dashboard, um, it, 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 it presents the data so a larger group of people can use it and you can tailor it to what those different groups wanna see. So rather than the CFO emailing their accounting department and saying, hey, can you send me the, the latest numbers for, for this field? And that takes a day or two for it to come back to them. And it may not be exactly what they wanted. So we automate all that. So like that CFO is just getting their report uh, every Monday morning, if that's when they want to see it, um, that, hmm. uh, that's dialed into what that what the CFO is actually looking for and not just like what is the raw export from their accounting software. Ah, interesting. Uh, so what are there any, I'm curious, like are there any misconceptions that you're seeing around energy analytics and in, 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 in oil and gas? Yeah, so uh, the three, so that, that was one of the topics you mentioned we might talk about. So I wrote, I was like, okay, what are the three, what are the first three things I think of with that? So mm -hmm. the first one in this, I'm sure this is not just oil and gas analytics, but analytics in general is there's a misconception that, or there, there can be a misconception that once you build the data process that it should just run forever uh with that like in a completely automated fashion like like that you've built a car and now you can drive it for a hundred thousand miles uh, before anything happens but i really the analogy i think more like we're more like landscapers that like the the initial there's a, a lot of initial work of like planting the trees in the right place and like trimming bushes and getting everything set up correctly but if you pay someone to do that and then no one ever works on your yard again. Like the we weeds are going to grow, like limbs are going to fall. Um, like somebody has to be in charge of over time keeping that running. So the in the, in the analytics world, there's things like like um, APIs, which are the that's the way that in an automated way you can get data out of these different sources. Those APIs change over time, or they go down, and we have to make adjustments for that. Um, people start entering data and like some somebody leaves the company, somebody new joins and they start entering the data in a way that they really shouldn't be. Like um, if you don't have if you don't have restrictions on it, somebody starts putting in narrative into a column um, that's supposed to be just uh, just supposed to be numbers. 
So that can break things. There's there's a lot of different ways that things go wrong and that it's not a huge effort to fix, but somebody still needs to be on tap um, to get those things fixed. So with our engagements with clients, like we support what we build basically forever. Like there, there's a forever relationship there um, because if we build something and hand it off to the team, like to the, the client, like they don't really know how to use it. Like we, we know how to use it. We know how to keep it running. Um, so part of our engagements that we insist on is that there's a, there's an ongoing relationship there. It's not just build it and hand it off. Um, I got you. People don't always understand that. They say like, well, you've written the code. It, you know, why, like, it should just, it should just work forever, but that's not, that's not the reality when you're tying together all these different data systems. Interesting. Do you, do you find like, so for a long time, there was trying to get data from operators or even anyone for that matter, like people held it so close to their chest. I mean, being that, like, do you still find that to be the case or are people a little bit more, I guess, less he hesitant to give up data for like third party use or like companies like yourself to come in and like dissect? Oh. Is that still a thing? Uh, kind of. So the, the companies that we work with know that they want to get more out of their data and they need help with it. And so mm. we, so one, like we, the work that we do for each client is, is totally siloed for each client. Like we're not, we're not aggregating multiple clients data together to do some kind of uh, like industry sure. level analysis. So like we're, the work that we're doing is tailored to each client. So that, that's a level of comfort there. Like we sign NDAs and that sort of thing. So their data is protected. Um, I'd say like the, the public companies are definitely more skittish about what can be done with their data. Where does it, it can never leave their network, that sort of thing. And, and we can work with that. Um, but yeah, generally like the bigger the company is, the more risk averse they are. Yeah. Do, do you, do you see, uh, I mean, are there any trends sort of developing like that moving into the future is going to help with, whether it be operational efficiencies or help CFOs or, I mean, do you see anything developing just on a macro level that, that you're getting excited about? Uh, what I'm, what I'm really excited about is the, uh, these new like large language models, AI related stuff. Like I'm, I'm definitely, we're definitely dipping our toes into that to figure out how that's going to change our industry. Um, yeah. And if, if you want to, we can spend the whole rest of the time talking about AI uh, <laughs> no, I, that's I, I I like I like building into it because again I like to cover other things too, but I find that AI is such a hot topic. And I mean I'm so I work for an oil field service company, and what what we find fascinating is over the years, a we've 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 grown through acquisition, so we have a bunch of like data sets coming from different companies that ultimately, if someone gets hired today, for them to go into our system and add a query of like i'm drilling in this area tell me about all the issues i might have from say surface down to intermediate casing point like for it to like gather a report reference papers like that would take days where we see the potential something like for us to be able to go in which we're working on so like i see the potential in that but like it's a, obviously a totally different end of the spectrum but the reality is is like taking a large amount of data organizing it and then delivering you somewhat of an answer if you ask the right queries. Um, but like for, from your standpoint, like where is that helping you guys? Yeah, so there's two things. There's how we're using it today and then what I'm kind of experimenting with for what what might happen in the next few years. Okay. Uh, so the way, the way we're using AI today is with various models that are, they all tie back to, to GPT-4, GPT-3. So that's open AI is, is the company that, they've created a lot of headlines. They, they're partnered, partnered with Microsoft and we're, we're a Microsoft shop. So everything that we do like in the cloud is Microsoft based. And so there's, there's starting to be some good integration between what AI, open AI is doing and the tools that Microsoft provides. So, so one, um, when we write a lot of Python code to do that's to generate reports or do analysis, say on like on spacing, um, that sort of thing, um, well spacing. Uh, so there's a product called Codex from GitHub that will suggest, like, it will suggest Python code for you as you write, you write comments about what you want to do and oh, it'll, wow. it'll generate the code in, like in the script that you're writing. And I've been using that for about six months or so. And it, it's, it's quite, it's, it's one of those like scary good things that, uh, 
make it doesn't write the whole script for you in one go. But as I'm working through, okay, I want to do this next. I want to do this next. Um, I find mm -hmm. writing the comment and then having um, this codex model generate the code underneath it is faster than me writing it. Or especially when there's times like any, anybody who writes code knows like the website, like Stack Overflow. So if you're trying to figure out how to do something that you already know, a lot of times you'll end up on, a, you'll end up Googling and then ending up on a thread on this website called Stack Overflow, reading, discussion, that sort of thing. And then you get the answer, you move on to the next problem. Um, problem. What I find is that that this, like using um, Codex or the other model I'll talk about, 90% of the time I get the answer that I want immediately um, wow. in line. So it definitely speeds up uh, the process of writing new code. Um, so that's, so Codex is one that's in, it's actually in the Python interpreter. So like somebody writing code, you're getting new code generated for you that has the context of the whole script that you're writing. So that, that's been, that's one of those things that's just shocking that, like that this exists versus like a year, a year ago, like I, I really didn't know that this, this was coming. So, so real quick, does that then lower the barrier of entry for someone for like a certain role? Because like, it, it sounds to me like you could almost have someone that doesn't necessarily understand how to write code if they understand how to somewhat read it to make sure it's heading in the right direction. It I mean, does. does it... Like I, I think it's it probably, it's it's tricky. Like I think it depends on the application, but I think it either, I think you could view it as either you could take someone like a, a junior developer, like a someone who knows Python, but they're just kind of starting out and yeah. they suddenly can operate at a much higher level because they have this like kind of instant access to a, a big bag of tricks that older developers have taken years to go like they, you know you've learned like the hard way gotcha uh, the, but the uh, the other way that you could take it is you could take one one senior python developer is so much more productive now because it just doesn't take them as long to write all the code that you don't need you don't need all the junior developers so there's more than one way to split it up but it definitely makes developers more productive Right. No, that's uh, that's an interesting way to look at it. It's not it, it basically just gives you more tools in the toolbox that you have access to. And so a junior developer can be that much better uh, and a senior person can be that much better. And so because, you know, the argument is like, oh, it's just coding's going to become commoditized. But it's kind of like ChatGPT and the way people are like, oh, it's, it's, you know, people can just use it to like cheat their way through college or whatever. But it almost is like I think the execution of a lot of things is coming commoditized, but it's the creativity and input and and almost you know like I, I have a feeling there's going to be like people are going to start hiring like chat gpt engineers because they just know how to yeah. have such good inputs and queries that can then deliver such awesome responses that then can use for to you know do other things and um i mean what's your thoughts on that yeah so you missed so chat well yeah i want to talk about chat gpt um the i do think it's going to become about using using the tools effectively. Like somewhere I read, like ChatGPT is like a calculator for language. Like when, when a calculator rolled out, it took things that had to be written out by hand and automated all that. You still had to know how math works, right? You get through way faster. And so we sort of have a calculator for writing, writing essays or that sort of thing. Um, so for us with ChatGPT, um, so everybody on my team, so I've got four, analytics engineers on my team. And then me is like the, the original person um, that, that's the head of the group. We all have subscriptions to chat, chat, GPT, chat GPT plus, which is, it's like $20 a month. Yeah. So with that, that's you have, do y'all, do I don't know. Have, sorry, have you, I, don't yeah, I mean, to, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I would say that's the one that I, I finally just bucked up and bought because I found it to be a lot more effective and, and for what yeah. I was using it for it. Yeah. Yeah, so with the plus version of it, you use the GPT-4 model versus the free one is GPT-3. And with, with my just kind of playing around with it, GPT-4 does seem like it's a lot smarter and like you, you get better responses enough where I thought it was worth um, worth upgrading for. Other things about GPT-4, like where I've used that is if I'm struggling with, a, again, like a, let's say like Python code where I'm getting an error over and over again, I can... Paste, like I've done this multiple times, I can paste that chunk of code in and just ask, where is my error? And it's oh, found, like in a, in a hundred lines of code, it said you, you forgot a, you forgot a, um, a value here and that, that, and it was correct. And so those sorts of things like, man, this thing, it, it's not a hundred percent foolproof. So it's not like 
this thing is going to be like a, a whole company can't just run off a of chat GPT for the sustainable <laughs> future, but it's smart. Like it, it really, it really can get a lot done for you. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that this just rolled out like two weeks ago. They added, there's a beta feature called code interpreter that can now run Python code in chat GPT. Um, so if you have the plus subscription, you can turn this on. Oh, and wow. so I, I tested this with, um, like when we do coding, inter when we do coding interviews to hire people, I have a little thing, like one of my questions is like, go get this data set. You're going to need to process it a little bit and then produce this chart. It's sort of a basic, you know, can can you string together some things in code? I I, I entered that for uh, in ChatGPT and it produced the the code that I wanted. So it had to do with it had to read in a CSV file. It was it was um, data on soccer teams and like soccer matches. So oh, I wanted cool. to know. Like, so I'm in Austin and I like uh, MLS. So I, I wanted to. I was like, how how good is uh, Austin FC doing this year? And it was a data set of every soccer team in the world, men's and women's, multiple years of data. And so submitting the, the CSV file, it was able to read it in, figure out what is an Austin FC, right? Like it has to understand no like way. what the concept is. Yeah. Uh, fell down to just this year and produce a chart that showed like the record of all the teams in MLS and then say, well, here's Austin FC. So that was another one where like every we keep on like leveling up really fast how this is going. It's hard to see where exactly, like where are we going to hit like the, the top end of the curve? Right. But I'm, I'm, yeah, as you can tell, like I'm, I'm pretty, pretty geeky about this stuff. Like I, I think it's at the level it is now, like it's world changing and it doesn't seem like it is stopping. Like we're, I don't think we've hit the ceiling yet on what this is going to be able to do. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I, I, I agree. And, um, I've listened, I listen to a ton of podcasts and, and, uh, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I don't do code and I'm not like into the analytics per se, like you are, but I do come from a technical background and, and, and even like I've copy and pasted tables of data into it and said, you know, synthesize the data and draw some conclusions, perhaps, you know, what are some trends? And, and, and I haven't found out a lot of times, like if I, for some weird reason, when I copy and paste a table into it, it, it only recognizes like a certain amount um, anyway, but it's even like small tables and stuff that I've tried to do. And, and it, it, it actually recognizes some pretty interesting trends and, and things like that. But um, to your, to your point about like where we are in the curve, like, I, I think where we see, like for so long, we thought AI was something totally different than, you know, now all of a sudden using it for, you know, writing essays or for like people yeah. on like a very generic basis. Like no one thought AI was going to do that. People thought it was going to be like robots, like AI exactly. robots, like walking around Amazon warehouses. And or stuff, like truck, which... yeah, truck, we thought truck drivers were going to be first to go, but it's like artists are like the most under threat. It's, it's shocking. Yeah. What we thought we had a year ago. It is, it is. And so, I mean, think about it, thinking about it from an oil and gas perspective, like what does your crystal ball say or look like in terms like, well, AI, because in, in my mind, I think it would be so cool is if somehow we were able to adopt AI in things like reservoir management and like adjusting pressures and, and valves real time at the wellhead to be able to like control and just optimize reservoir management on like, say a big field, um, whether it be through in, like, in, like if you're doing a water flood or EOR or stuff like that, like if you were to just have all this data talk to each each other and and somehow figure that out i don't like because again it's 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 like how you know all these operators talk about you know sustainable operations and you know i, I think we do we're getting better at optimizing our fields um drilling better wells completing better wells do, do you see this like changing the game on like a very high level or do you think it'll just kind of help companies become more efficient to where perhaps they can maybe reduce overhead or make better decisions to have healthier financials. I mean, yeah. where, where do you kind of see the future in this? I don't know. It's, it's really hard to, to say with, with a ton of confidence, I think like, what, <laughs> yeah, but I'd say like that, like the things that pop into my head are that oil and gas is a very physical, like it lives in the real world in terms of like, there's guys setting pipe out on the, on the drilling rig, um, that sort of thing. ChatGPT is not going to help out with, right? It's it's more it's back office stuff or like you said optimization. Um, I, I do think it'll have an impact there. I think the industry in general, like ten years or farther back, 
a lot of people have come out and said like, here's my AI based black box. That's going to tell your company like what decision it needs to make. And I, to my, I don't think that has been ultra successful. Like I, I, I can't think of a lot of examples where that's, where, where oil and gas companies are just trusting kind of like this AI genie to tell them where to drill or, um, you know, what, what, what mix of chemicals and sand to, to put in for their completions. Sure. Um, we, what we've really found like a, like a, a wheelhouse is being able to combine different data sets and uh, produce easy to digest results. So it's more like, it's more like reporting stuff that the information's there, but it's, Nobody can get it together in a way that they can um, they can see and act on. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do. Let's see from from our, from our own like from my industry of data analytics, um, where I think this can go. It's not there yet, but I see that the piece is falling into place. Is where there is a a, a conversational agent, like a like I call it a chatbot, but that has access to all the company's internal data, like understands that that context. And instead of it being uh, a PDF report that gets emailed out or a dashboard that somebody has to learn how to use, you just, you talk, like you and I are talking, you'd say, okay, which which wells do we need to be, like are, are, are underperforming that we need to send our team to look at? And on the back end, it has access to the data sources. It can crunch those numbers based on your actual your request. You don't have to learn new software. And it yeah. starts giving you, okay, here's, here's my, here, here are the wells you need to go look at. Um, a lot of those pieces are in place. So even with what, what I'm saying about uh, with Microsoft and OpenAI, uh, this isn't like in the you know, last weeks or month or two, there's there's now um, like you can run OpenAI's models uh, in a siloed Azure environment so that like you're not sending it to OpenAI, like a company because data security is, is one issue that needs to be checked off before mm -hmm. companies get comfortable with this. They don't want to send all their accounting data off to open AI, like, and, and what are they doing with it? But I think people trust Microsoft, like they're already hosting your data. Um, so you can now run these models within Azure, like within your, within your private environment. Um, and I've been testing this out. And then the other thing is that the ability to upload files or like data into the, like for the, so the chat bot can understand that context of, well, it needs to see the data to be able to comment on it. You can do that now too through these. It's called a um, AI playground. It's uh, it's a wow. it's like a testing space in Microsoft with these Open AI models. Uh, so all of this is falling. It's falling into place where when Open AI kind of first made the news, let's say like six or eight months ago, and I tested it kind of the way that you're talking about, where I paste it in some of my soccer data and I asked like how you know what was Austin FC's record last year and it said they won two games which is completely wrong and I was like okay this this thing is nowhere near where it would need to be to start making strides in what we do yeah. um, we're about a year later and like I said it can now interpret that correctly and make me a chart like a lot like real time for what I'm looking for um, so mm. all, all that is the, the acceleration that has been been amazing. So I, beyond that, like in terms of like how this is going to affect the industry, it, it gets it, it gets out of my wheelhouse in terms of uh, you know reservoir engineers like automating uh, forecasting. I mean, we've been doing that like the industry, like people have been automating decline curve forecasting for years, but there's still reservoir engineers doing decline curve forecasting. And how is that going to affect like picking tops for geologists? Like I think it'll yeah affect all of that. Um, I do think adding like a conversational, like a, a AI bot conversational interface on top of all these softwares that we're used to using is probably something that's gonna happen. So that rather than needing to understand 80 different steps in a piece of software to get through your analysis, you're gonna be able to talk to it and say what you want it to do and have it, like the, the companies that are on this and implement this sort of thing, the, the chat interface will take over from needing to click through mm. menus. Gotcha. No, but I, I, do, I do think it's kind of anybody's guess, the, you know, where, what yeah. gets affected more and less. Yeah. And I think it's, it depends on what industry. And obviously when we talk oil and gas, it's like, there's so many industries and sub industries um, to, to, again, I mean, you could throw up a Hail Mary and, and 
there's a chance you might hit it because I think the opportunities are endless. And I think there's things that we're talking about today that in five years from now are going to be non-existent and something just, it, it's going to evolve like in such a way that I don't think like, we'll look back, but like, we had no idea where this was going and and we thought it might've been this, but now look at it. It's um, you know, again, which I, you know, I find exciting. I think, you know, the, the chaos and the, the unknown will breed like so much yeah. innovation. It's. Yeah. You make, you make me think of, um, I'm old enough for like, I remember like the beginning of like the internet revolution. <laughs> yeah. I remember like there was an ad, there was more than one ad where it seemed like people were fixated on like the internet might bring the possibility of having like video calls. And that was kind of as far as people could think, you know, like you'd be at like the pay phone and there'd be yeah. a little TV screen where you could see the person's face above it. And that was sort of like the, man, it, this might be what happens one day. And that's such, yeah. I mean, that's Zoom, right? Like that's what we're on right now. But that's yeah. just, you know, that's your five, you know, that was 5% of the way into like, now like people never look up from their phones and it changes, you know, it changes how like parents interact with their kids. And it, it was so yeah. much bigger than that, that I think when we talk about, when I say like, there's going to be a chat bot that you can, you know, that you don't have to like click buttons anymore. That's probably the same sort of thing that like the impact of this is so much bigger than what we can even really game out right now. Yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, I, I, it, it reminds me of, you know, just like social media platforms. Like when Facebook came out, it was meant for something and now look at it. It's a, it's completely changed and same with Instagram. And, and I think those are just examples of like when things hit the market and we think, Oh, this is what it's for. And imagine if it could do that it like morphs into something so different. And uh, so again, it's, to me, it's, 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 it's super exciting. I mean, what what's your sort of, not necessarily argument, but what's your response to people that are like doomsday preppers? It's like, oh, this AI thing, like, it's just, it's gonna It's the end of mankind. Like, do you ever have those kind of conversations? I read a ton about this. So I've, I've definitely read there's, there's pros and cons to it. I think they're, there are real dangers that we need to be aware of. Like this is sort of on the more on the level of like, we need to treat these like nuclear weapons eventually. Like this is, uh, so I think, so if you're re reading about like, so alignment is the term for this. Like you, as, as these AI models get smarter, they're not a danger today. Like what we have right now is not gonna go Terminator on us. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the, the the key tipping point is it's artificial general intelligence. So that's where uh, I don't personally I don't see any any real showstoppers between getting from where we are today to an AI that is smarter than people are basically across any any place you would measure it. Once you get to that point, the this gets into like there's concepts like um, there's an intelligence explosion singularity. Like you'll hear these terms thrown around. Where what happens when you have an AI that's smarter than people and you and it you ask it to make a smarter version of its, itself that it can self iteratively wow yeah yeah it, it can self iteratively improve to where we don't really know where the end of that process is um and it, it, for for listeners like the the two two things that I've I've digested that have I thought been been super interesting on this front there's a book called Super Intelligence by Nick Bostrom okay. um that I read in 2017 and a lot of, you know, what we're going through now is it's, it's in his, it's in his book and it seemed very sort of like, well, maybe this will happen someday. I don't, or, you know, maybe this is just kind of more futurology. Um, but we're definitely like, we're into like the meat of what he was predicting or describing in his book. So I think that's a really interesting one for people to look at. And then there's, okay. there's another podcast, um, it's called Cold Takes by Holden Karnofsky. And he really goes into some of the implications of, of where we are right now um, in terms of um, artificial minds and that sort of thing. So it's wow. it's hard to talk about this stuff without and not sound like you're crazy because there's, right. there, there's so many, uh, th there's a lot of different kind of what we, from today we consider like weird places that this could go. Um, and, but it's really hard to tell what, what's actually actually going to happen yeah no I, I, sorry, I, I, I do think it does need to be taken seriously like the the um the idea that oh we'll just put we'll, we'll unplug it if it gets too dangerous i think that's really naive um yeah 
No, that's kind of like saying, oh, we just turn the internet off if if the world gets too addicted to technology. Like, it's right. not going to happen. Like, the toothpaste is so far out of the tube. It's like controlling it is going to be like, so do you think the government is going to be heavily involved to, to help regulate any of this? Or is it going to be up to no. like the private sector? Or... I, we, uh, the, the government isn't particularly effective at, at getting its hands in, into anything these days. <laughs> I, I imagine it's, I think, I think paralysis is more like from the government perspective is probably more likely what's to happen. And so then we need to, Fair enough. we're kind of in the hands of the, the Facebooks and the open AIs and the, and the, you know, the Amazons of the world. Like I, I hope they, I hope they're cautious about it. Mm. Uh, but you've got this, you've got, kind of got an arms race, right? Like you, these different companies are trying to be the first to market. Like what open AI did is kind of upset the apple cart for Google because they have, they have um, kind of search locked down. They have for 20 years and they make billions of dollars off of it. But for me, like, like I said, like I use this stuff every day. Like I use chat GPT and, and then the coding version of that every day. And I definitely go to Google less than I did before because if I, have, if I have a question, I'll go to chat GPT because it, it's generally faster. Do you ever, do you use Bard? Uh, that one, I think I've, I've tried it, but like I've already kind of settled on like I'm already used to using chat GPT. And so yeah. that's where the switching costs, like that sort of the network effect. Um, that's why there's such a first mover advantage because like I'm already used to using um, the chat GPT one. Um, if, okay. if, I, I think it could change. Like I think somebody else could come up with something better. So Google's working on one called Gemini. Ah. And uh, that is a... I'm not not the expert in this, but they want to combine a large language model, which is what OpenAI is, with um, with uh, what they had Alpha AlphaGo, uh, which is a uh, it's a self teaching model. So that that's a whole other interesting one. Like there's a a Netflix documentary about the first uh, about DeepMind. That's Google Google's company um, beating the world's world champion Go player, and I think it was around twenty. 17 or something like that wow. it's a really interesting documentary to go look at um what's it called do you remember uh it's, it's on and you said it was on netflix it's on it's on netflix no um, worries well i'll i'll dig around I don't, and fun yeah I, I don't know it's um but they it, it's their their computer model beat the world champion go player that's crazy. Uh, and what they're trying to do is combine this model that taught itself how to play Go by playing against itself. So it's like this, they didn't even teach it how to play. They just gave it the rules and had it play different versions of itself. And it became the best in the world. Um, if two they, of those versions played each other. I feel like it would just like, it would implode. Like it would just like, <laughs> like sketch out and be like no response. <laughs> Uh, well, whichever one wins, it becomes the new sort of champion. <laughs> uh, I just, you just wonder if at any point it, it will ever win. Like if you had two of the best players fighting each other all the time, like it would it would just be a, an infinite draw. I don't know. It's it's such a like weird thing to think about. <laughs> um, I, I'm curious. So on you, you obviously are pretty proficient in chat GPT. I, and so I use it for like very basic stuff. Like I'm a podcaster and, and a salesman. So it's like I use it for like my show notes and stuff like that, which it does a great job. But the problem I have is when I, when I, I track, when I export transcripts from podcasts and I try and upload it to summarize it, it says it's too long. So then I have to do it in like segments. Is there like a hack to like be able to upload like 8,000 words instead of only like 2,500 words? Yeah. So what, what you're running into, um, so the chat model, it has a certain context length. So it can only, like it can remember what you're talking about, but it can only remember so much before it starts forgetting the older stuff. So if you upload uh, your text, it's too big for it to like take into context for it to then work on. Um, I think that's one of the things that I think it'll, uh, a year from now, context sizes will probably be 10 times bigger um, where we're kind of in like the AOL dial-up era of this. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I, I think I think that issue will will go away probably shortly but in terms of like a hack i think doing what you're talking about if you probably have to paste it in uh a chunk at a time i don't have that's what i'm doing yeah i just i, I just randomly wanted to ask because I, like, <laughs> I mean people play with this stuff like non-stop and so someone might have been like well yeah you gotta just do this this and that and that's like you know sometimes you'll ask it a question and it'll say i'm not like 
basically say, I'm not capable. I'm not authorized to answer these types of questions, but if you prompt it correctly, then you can re-ask the question. And it will yeah. answer that question. <laughs> yeah. You can like, you can convince it to, uh, to do something that it just said it couldn't do. <laughs> I, 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 I haven't tried this, but now that you can upload files, it'd be interesting for you to try uploading uh, as a text rather than pasting it in. Doing uh, it as a upload as yeah. a text file and see if it, it gets any more mileage out that way. You said a, a text file. Yeah. So you know, you can, this is again just in the last couple of weeks. You can upload files to Chat GPT. Um, I think it's a beta feature. Do you know what I'm talking about? Or not? Not yet. Uh, not yet. I'm going to have to pull it up and see. Cause I, I mean, I, I haven't seen that. Like I use it every day too. And I may have just right, overlooked I'm, it, but let me, I'm going to use my other screen to go figure out. Um, so where you want to go is to, uh, go to settings and beta at the bottom. Let's and see. Beta features. Let's see. Settings and beta. Yeah. And so for the listeners out there, look, we're giving you something valuable. You're, you're learning. This is good. This is good. So I see general beta features. Oh, here we go. Let's see. So this is where all like the cool new stuff that they add in lives. So if you turn on, so I see custom instructions that lets you bake some information into every conversation. Like I tell it, you are a Python coding expert. And so that actually helps it give better responses because it tells it how it, it tells it how it needs to act rather than like every possible personality it could have. It understands, okay, this is the type of question he's going to be asking. Mm-hmm. Um, Got it. Turning on plugins and code interpreters, the other one that I can see, that's the one that it will actually write Python code in the interpreter to, to generate the outputs that you're looking for. Um, so gotcha. up- Uploading files. I'm trying to remember where that's done. I'll um, ask uh, ChatGPT how to upload files. It might even yeah, tell me. I don't, you know, we don't want to go into just like a, a like a, a support session here on, on the <laughs> podcast. But I, I know you, I know you can do it where you upload it, and then it can it can actually speak intelligently about what what's in the data and like do an act on the data. I'll have to try that. And, and for the folks out there, I, you know, I, I live in a bubble and I feel like everyone that I talk to uses chat GPT, but if, if you haven't, um, like I was talking to a good buddy of mine, Ryan Walker, he's, he's more on the political space, um, up in Washington. Um, I've had him on the podcast, but uh, when he was down in Houston last time, we were at the petroleum club and I was talking about it and he was kind of like, Oh man, this chat GPT. And I started telling him like what I use it for and some of the stuff. And I said, man, like, here's how you could use it in your day to day. And like the light bulb went off and he was like, Oh shit. Like I didn't. Okay. Now that you say it like that, like, I think this is something I could actually use. And so it's like, they're, they're, it, it can help anybody. Like whether you're a landscaper or a engineer, like it just play around with this stuff. Cause I, it's, it's kind of like one of those things that everyone didn't want to use cell phones. Cause they were just like, Oh, I just got my landline. But if, if you fall behind too far, you're going to become irrelevant. So for everyone out there, who's not playing with chat GPT, that's my last take. Kevin, this has been an absolute fascinating conversation. I feel like we just scratched the surface. Um, what I'll do, what's the best way to reach out uh, to you or if someone wants to get to know more about JetRock? What I'll do, I'll put the link in the show notes. But besides like LinkedIn, yeah. like, are there any other platforms that you guys see content on? Yes, yeah, so our, our website is jetrockllc.com. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. My email is kthuot at jetrockllc.com. So you can email us or you can email us through the website. Uh, we post stuff on LinkedIn too, so you can hit up me or Zach there. Um, and we're we definitely like talking with, with just meeting more people in the industry. So even if it's like a more of an um, uh, informational conversation uh, yeah. versus like oh like you know we have we have some immediate need, definitely like we're 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 happy to to talk to various people in the industry. So feel free to reach out. That's awesome, Kevin. Well, again, thank you very much. And for the listeners, if you could review, subscribe, uh, share this with someone that you might think would be interested uh, in learning about what we talked about today. Um, and if you could, if unless you're driving, of course, I've got a lot more downloads than I do review. So uh, if you got a chance to uh, type in a review, that'd be fascinating. Kevin, thanks again for joining yeah. us. Thank you for having out. me on. Yeah. Absolutely. And for all the listeners, always remember that everyone deserves access to energy and we is greater than me. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Right. Take care.